I just started recording. He was giving me some permission options. So thank you again. Great. So let me share my screen again. Mal paso. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So as I was saying, let me start from the beginning so that we can record that information. So today training will last approximately two hours, maybe a little bit less. I'm going to try to go very through all the points and be very specific on them. However, you always have, if you have questions, even after the meeting, feel free to uh, call me or send me a message and I can go over the, the questions with you that you have, okay? So feel free to always ask questions, even mm -hmm. after the training. Um, I have one break planned during this training uh, around maybe 2 to 15. And all attendees needs to be, need to be muted throughout the training so that I can talk without interruption and also so that you can talk without interruption. I'm going to have a QA session at the end of this training so we can submit questions at any time. And I'll monitor the chat and I think Betty and, and Jean will also monitor the chat. Um, so we have some training objectives here. The objective of this training is we're going to review the ethics, conduct, and professional conduct of interpreters. We're going to talk about developing skills as a family resource li liaison and district interpreters and translators so that you can serve uh, as interpreters in, in a community setting in your schools. We're also going to clarify the roles of interpreters and cultural mediators. And we also, we're also going to talk about functional vocab uh, vocabulary as well. At the end of this training, you should be able to recognize the interpreter roles and definitions. You're also going to become proficient in facilitating interpreting encounters. We're also going to help you build some interpreting skills or give you the foundation so that you can build interpreting skills. And, and the last one is very important, is under, understand the interpreter code of ethics, okay? So that's the learning objectives. So before that, um, let's see how much time we have. Let's do this. Let's keep the introductions for now. I, I know most of you, and I think you know most of you guys. Maybe at the middle of the training, we, depending on how we're doing with the time, we'll do introductions, okay? Because uh, I think we're running a little bit out of time. So let, let me introduce myself. My name is Ricardo Del Bosque. I have 15 years of interpreting experience. I've been doing interpreting for a while. I'm a social services interpreter. I'm a medical interpreter and I'm a certified code interpreter as well. I've been doing interpreting for many companies, including school districts. And, but I have to say Shelton School District is my favorite client and I love working with you guys, I, I definitely do. I work also for police departments and, and some law offices. I've done work for some uh, uh, law offices as well. And what I have to say, interpreting is something that I enjoy the most. Uh, other than translating, is interpreting is it, it gets you on the action. It's something that is very engaging. And, and this is a re very recent picture of last week of me right there. So you can see it. <laughs> so let's begin by talking a little bit about a code of ethics, interpreting boundaries and code of ethics. Now, this training encompasses four, uh, four units, which is interpreter ethics, uh, the role of the interpreter, uh, navigating uh, problems as interpreter, and, uh, and vocabulary. I'm going to do the best of covering all four. Uh, if I may skip one, I'll let you know, and maybe we can resume that unit at a later training. But at least I want to make sure that I talk to you guys this uh, this afternoon about interpreting 
a cut of ethics, okay? So interpreters and translators serve as the only gateway between two people who speak different languages. That's why role of ethics in interpreting is very, very important because we usually hire, we are hired to interpret in sometimes delicate situations. There are rules that were created in, in, in order to keep a, a high level of professionalism. Interpreters and translators are faced with an abundance of ethical issues that they must work through on a daily basis, while at the same time, interpret and translate in a professional and ethical manner. Uh, there are a variety of scenarios in which professional, professional interpreters and translators must maintain an ethical standard at all times in order to stay neutral and to avoid intervening in a situation that could perhaps model the, 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 the interpretation process. So I wanna to talk to you guys a little bit about five interpreting code of ethics that are very, very important and that, and that interpreters must maintain at all times. Uh, while this code of ethics uh, do exist in some uh, other companies, in some other professions, uh, interpreter code of ethics are, this particular code of ethics are specifically to interpreters. Now we, a, a, a teacher has a code of ethics, a doctor has a code of ethics, but these ones are specifically catered to, to interpreters. Uh, so the, the five code of ethics that I want you to remember are accuracy, confidentiality, impartiality or neutrality, adherence, staying within the role of boundaries of the interpreter, and professionalism. Uh, so do you guys have any questions about these five code of ethics? I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of them, but I wanna see if you guys have any questions so far about these five code of ethics. Okay. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about these five code of ethics. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna ask somebody, can somebody tell me what is ethics? or ethics. Can somebody tell me? Oh, and I forgot to mention this. I'm a horrible teacher. So what I'm going to do at some times, I'm going to go through the chat or the participants list, and I may just call somebody. I'm gonna call, call, call somebody. So don't be afraid if I, if I just called, call you and ask you a question too. So. <laughs> I may do that from once in a while. So if if I call if I call call somebody, don't be afraid and don't be don't be if taken I, taken aback. If I volunteer to tell you what I think ethics is, will you not? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So ethics is, I guess, like your moral principles that shape your behavior. Absolutely, that's an excellent definition. Yes. Okay, I'm off the hook. Excellent, you are off the hook, thank goodness. <laughs> so excellent, so yes, like, just like you said, uh, your job as an interpreter into, is to interpret to the best of your ability and do it in such a way that maintains a moral and ethical standard, right? Uh, in also uh, a standard that is fair a standard that is transparent. In, in, in interpreting, that's what, that's what ethics is all about. So I wanna to talk to you guys about the five code of ethics that are uh, in, in, in an interpreting setting. The first one is accuracy. As I said, your job as an interpreter is to interpret to the best of your ability exactly what the applicant or the teacher or the student said without adding omitting or, or any adjustment of what, of what was just said. Uh, you should never leave any part that carries meaning out of the message. Do not add or subtract from the message. And that includes repetition, self-corrections, 
etc., given by the inter by the by the speaker, whether it's the teacher, the mom, or the students. In other words, if the teacher says something that she uh, that she said incorrectly, you should interpret that as well. Also, the interpreter the interpreter interprets in first person. The interpreter also makes sure that the level of language register matches the, the original message. In other words, if the teacher is interpreting in a, um, in a very technical way, you should interpret in that way. You should match the register. And that's what register is, is the level of language. I'm gonna quiz you about that, that terminology later. Register is the level of language. And that level of language needs to match the speaker. We also need to pay careful attention to word choice and faithfully convey as well the meaning of idioms and slang as well. The interpreter should never simplify messages to make them easier to understand. In addition, you cannot guess what they mean and you must be, you must be certain before you interpret the topic or the, or the word that you just interpret. That's why if you need to ask for repetition or you can always clarify if necessary. Okay. Now, if you are translating and you are not sure for a word, you should always check a dictionary. Okay. But again, if you are not sure, always ask for clarification. Uh, transparency, this is also very important in, 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 in accuracy. Everybody should know what the interpreter is saying. And also everybody should know what is being said at all times. If you ever make a comment as an interpreter, your comment must be interpreted to both sides. So let's say uh, if you have a comment that you need to address to the teacher or the student or the teacher or the mom, you need to say the interpreter has a question and you need to relay that information to both parties to keep transparent the conversation. And this is also very important. You should also include the tone of voice that shows emotion in your interpreting. For example, frustration, sadness, anger, joy, laughter. That is something that is embedded in the communication process. And it should be obvious to the recipient of the intended message. So in other words, if the, if the parent is showing that he is very distraught because of their children's uh, grades, you need to ensure that that distraught or that emotion is being shown to the recipient, in this case, the teacher as well. Okay. And the last point that I want to say about accuracy is that the interpreter manages the flow of the communication to ensure accuracy. And this is very, very important. Sometimes teachers, they tend to speak very fast. So the interpreter needs to stop the speaker at all times to ensure that they don't go for too long so that you can provide an accurate interpretation. So I repeat a few things. I, I, I said a lot of in this, in this topic. Again, I just wanna make a quick summary is interpret exactly what is being said. The message is deli del delivered exactly as it is. Interpret asks for repetition or clarification if necessary. We need to be transparent. We need to interpret with emotion and the tone of voice to the intended recipient and we need to manage the flow of communications. So that is the, the sort of ethics for accuracy. You guys have any questions? Okay, I'm gonna to talk to the, the next point, and that is confidentiality. And that is something that I think is it's obvious when it comes to, to the work that we do. Okay, it looks like somebody is trying to come in. Okay, confidentiality. Interpreters must keep all information confidential and, they, uh, and the information that they have access should remain between, between the intended parties only. Interpreters do not reveal any information about an assignment to anybody. Again, only within the, the intended parties. All information remains strictly confidential, including written information about the, about the student or the teacher. The interpreter must protect 
but destroy also any notes taken during the assignment. So let's say you're taking notes and you wrote the patient's date of birth or the patient's um, last four of the social, you need, to re you need to remember that you need to shred that information. Okay? And sometimes we make notes so that we can remember to give to a teacher or something. You need to ensure that all that information never leaves the, the boundaries of the school. And you need to be sure to remove that information, okay? And also I'm gonna remind if you guys can put mute, uh, uh, that'd, be, that'd be fantastic, okay? Now, the other information that I wanna talk about when it comes to confidentiality is that the interpreter never reveals any information about anything about the about the uh, about any 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 patient right whether it is uh, in, in information to your friends spouses never all the information should remain confidential okay any questions about about this okay impartiality this one is a very good one, and I'll tell you guys why. Interpreters always need to stay neutral, and they never show any bias or towards, towards the student or the teacher, never at all. The interpreter needs to remain partial and, and always need to remain with their opinions to, the, to themselves. Now, it is very important that the interpreter never show that they are what they are thinking, right? Because sometimes we have implicit biases, and that's normal. I mean, sometimes we have those biases, and those biases are hard to fight with. However, we should never visibly react to the content of a message or the content that we are interpreting. And we, and we never should, uh, should try to show sympathetic to either side, either, never, right? And sometimes it's hard as because uh, we work in a school and sometimes we try to make sure that we put a advocate role sometimes and we try to advocate in behalf of the mom or the student or sometimes if the teacher is trying to encourage a student sometimes we try to also act as an advocate to the teacher and as the role of us as an interpreter we should never do that uh, and the other thing that we need to ensure that is that we should never, never show any type of, um, or take any assignments where we may feel that there's a conflict of interest. And it, I see Andres Francisco uh, raise his hand. Let me just finish this topic, okay? Uh, and, I'll, and I'll address your question. Sometimes if we are interpreting for a sensitive topic, and, and that person is our neighbor or our close friend or our family member, we need to ensure that at the minimum, we disclose our relationship to that party. And sometimes due to limitations with our interpreters and limitations with our staff, I mean, maybe it may be hard to schedule an hour interpreter in such a short notice, but at a minimum, we need to ensure that we disclose that relationship. And the teacher can say, yes, it's fine, or no, I want another interpreter. And Andres, uh, please go ahead and, and ask your question, please. So my question is, um, does that mean that if the parents um, or, or something that they're saying or as interpreter, they ask you, um, where should I go to do this or something does that mean you can't refer to the like anywhere they can go or if they ask any like question just because they they might know you mm -hmm. that's an excellent question and thank you for addressing that because i'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about that later now you have a particular interesting role as, as family liaisons and in, in the schools that you represent. You have a particular role that you need to be sometimes doing many things at once. Now, in this particular role that I'm stating right now, you as the interpreter, you need to follow the standards, okay? Now you have another role perhaps as a, as a mediator or, or problem solver or 
or someone who needs to navigate certain bureaucracy. Now in those roles as a mediator, or as a advocate, you can do that. And absolutely you should do that. But as an interpreter, when you're in, engaging in the process of interpreting, you should never do that. Why? Because we need to remain in neutrality and in, in impartiality between the speaker and the recipient of the message. But when you're outside the, the bound of interpreting, yes, you can do that. You're absolutely welcome to do that. And you actually, you are encouraged to do that based on what you do as a, as a family liaison, so yes. Did I answer your question? So the next one, oh, go ahead. I have a question. So when you are um, in a in a conference or a meeting and with a parent, but you want to be as an advocate, you need to request an interpreter and you need to be there as an advocate because you can, like you say, you can do both, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Now there's many times in which you may be able to to act as an advocate right after the meeting and say, hey, Lucrecia, I know you're the family liaison, liaison resource of my school. Can you help me do this? Can you help me do this? And you absolutely, yes, I can. But again, to maintain transparency between the speaker or the teacher and the, and the student, which who is the client at that time or the mom, you need to maintain transparency at all times so that the teacher is not wondering, so what, what is Lucrecia telling the mom? Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that, right? So, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that on the, on the next, on the next uh, uh, ethical principle here. So, but good questions. Next point is that the uh, adherence or staying within the boundaries of the interpreter, okay? The interpreters need to work within their professional boundary and do not get personally involved in, in, in their assignment or their case. Uh, the interpreter needs to limit their professional involvement in individual interactions with, with students or teachers and parents after the interpreter encounter, right? I mean, and I, and I guess within, within the appropriate boundary, right? Again, you guys play a, an, an interesting role as, as resources in your school. So with that, within that boundary, it's okay. However, when we have, uh, when you are uh, close friends with them or, or maintain a very close personal relationship with them and you are interpreting for them, that might be seen as a conflict of interest a little bit. Uh, and that's actually the only thing I want to talk a little bit about that. There's other points, but they're not applicable to you, I, I, I think. Now, the other point that I want to talk to you a little bit about here is that sometimes um, we need to be careful on, on also receiving gifts, right? And when I say receiving gifts, sometimes it's hard not to say no to certain things, but we need to be alert on, on the appearance of... Um, of impropriety, especially when in the role of an interpreter, right? So, so that's another thing I want to mention to you. Uh, professionalism in, in, in code of ethics. This one is also very interesting, right? Uh, we also, uh, as a professional, we need to maintain a professional standard at all times. We need to dress appropriately and we need to be prepared for the, and pre prepare for the job. We need to be respectful to both the, the teacher and the student. We need to be honest also in our capability to interpret or translate, right? So if, we're, if we are not honest to ourselves about a particular assignment, we need to say, hey, you know, I don't feel comfortable about this because I might not be able to interpret the best that I can, right? Uh, and also, we need to also present solutions to problems if the interpretation is challenged. So, and this happens sometimes, and I, this, this has happened to me. So sometimes I'm interpreting and the teacher speaks a little bit Spanish, right? And the teacher says, uh, that's not what I said. What you just interpret, that's not what I said. Or the mom may interpret, may speak a little bit of English or the, or the student speaks English most of the times. 
And this and the student may say, that's not what my mom said, or that's not what the teacher said. We need to be we need to be respectful how we address those issues, right? And I'm gonna show you some techniques to do that, okay? Any questions about this one, about prof uh, being, being professional as an interpreter? Questions, comments on this one? So I have a question. Um, so what I'm required from time to time, I'm not a, a, obviously a native Spanish speaker. Um, I have been required to, and just said, hey, you have to do this. You have to interpret a, a, some sort of a, an extemporaneous event where people are speaking in English and I might have half a dozen or more Spanish speaking families. Uh, it, there is not always the opportunity nor the option to say no. What, what does one do then? Absolutely, no, and, and I think I mentioned that earlier. Sometimes be, because of the, our constraints with staff and, and our constraints with our, um, our constraints with our limitations, uh, sometimes we don't have that ability, right? What I would say is what I would tell, what I have told to other people before, is that you disclose that information with your whoever is your immediate supervisor, right? And say, uh -huh. hey, you know, I'm I I'm being asked to do this. Uh, perhaps I don't feel comfortable. What What do you think? And 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 allow them to resolve that. Whether it is they say, you know, do work to the best of your ability. <laughs> that's fine. But I mean, I I I don't have a I don't have a jurisdiction over. <laughs> You should go or you shouldn't go because again, that's, I'm not your employer, but I always say be honest with, with whoever. Be honest in your dealing as an, as an interpreter. Okay. Uh, I don't know, uh, Beatriz, Jean, what, what do you guys think on that? Betty, you might want to respond, but I, um, I think each situation is a little bit different because because as a family liaison, that is, that's part of your role is to um, is to interpret for your families. Can, Bill, can you be uh, more specific about you know your yeah your I, I can. Yeah, Betty and I have had this discussion. Yeah, I don't want to take any time with this, but uh, for example, uh, let's uh, a, a typical one is like awards night. So, I think I have convinced them that we really really need somebody at at R Ricky's level. Um, but yeah, it's, unless you are super fluent back and forth in both languages, it's really hard to do on the fly accurate translation when you've got 25 different people with 25 different messages about why their, uh, you know, their beca, their scholarship is so important. and. Anyway, there are situations arise, and that's just an example of one, but there's not always the opportunity, I think, and that's what Ricky was saying, is that you go to your supervisor and you say, listen, this is not my gift. Uh, and, and what you get is, uh, well, just do your best. Okay, I'll do my best. It's not gonna be very good. And I know that, and I'm trying to be honest with you, but it's, uh, so it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just referencing what you were saying, Ricky, that that has put me in, in a bad position more than once. I understand. And the no, people I, that must I, listen to me, that's yeah. the one, oh, they're the ones I worry about. And I think, you know, those situations should be taken one by one and, you know, um, brought to Betty's and my attention. And, um, you know, is there any way we can get Ricky or one of our, contracted interpreters to at least help with, you know, some of this. So, um, okay. So that brings up the question, is there a budget for that or, or is it going to be the standard response that we don't have any money? I, I think it's always been the situation where, um, we, here's what we say to the buildings and the principals, you always go to your building bilingual paratech first your family lays on first for any interpretation needs because that that is part of the job that's part of the job description right. right if it's something special unique and doesn't happen all the time and you need additional help or special help 
that's when you bring it to Betty and or me and we try to get you more help. Um, because I understand what you're saying and there is a budget for um, interpretation needs. Okay. So I think we can be uh, flexible in helping you know. when it makes sense. And right. um, either either me and or Betty, we're, we're kind of working together and because there's so, the, the need is just growing and growing and growing. Um, so we kind of work together and in this. Okay, that, sorry, I don't help? want to take any more time on it, but thank you. No, no. Thank you, and, and this is a great segue to what I was about to say, uh, Bill, and thank you for saying that, Jean, too. And, and, and Jean uh, and, and everybody, I'm, I'm, I'm always available to, I mean, Jean always knows. I mean, when you ask me, Jean, I, I rarely, sometimes I do say no, but I rarely I say no. I mean, when you guys ask me to go to a conference, I always try to, to be there. And always. what I want to do, and what I want to do, Bill, and, and Beatrice and everybody, I was trying to think of a way to do a conference interpreting training. Because that's really the only way that you can actually learn how to do that. Because again, it's, it's not something that you are, uh, accrue immediately, right? It's, it's, it's something that you have to take practice and practice and practice. Now, there's a technique that I use when I do that. And, and, and I talked to Beatrice about this and to Jean that I, I want to go ahead and maybe institute some type of training that maybe five hours in every school year, you have to help in some type of conference or help me in a conference interpreting session so that you can see how I do it. And there's techniques such as anticipation, um, and headphones to taking notes. I'll show you a technique that I do about taking notes that is really, really good so that you can remember how to, uh, a lot of the things that these people are saying. There's some techniques that I, I want to share with you. Today, I, I might not share too much detail about that because today is more like a, the foundation, but I want to go over this information with you at a later time, if, if that's okay with you. But great, great segue, because I wanted to talk a little bit about that with you, with you guys uh, uh, at some point during the training. So hey, Ricky, uh, and this yeah. is for everybody that's listening in. Uh, Betty and I can discuss with our um, directors that maybe we can offer um, another training session after the first of the year in preparation for the March conferences and take it to the next step. Um, so maybe it's the same group of people, all of us together, um, doing it again in like a part two in a little bit more detail. So we'll take that offline and, and discuss it a little bit more. Yeah, and, and maybe in the future, if I may, uh, this training that I created, I've done it a few times. Uh, it's better sometimes if we do it in person, and I know with COVID it's kind of hard, but so that we can role play, so that you can see the, the cadence, but I, I leave it up to you guys. Uh, I mean, we can always adapt, but this one is about conference interpreting and simultaneous interpreting and consecutive interpreting. It's always better to do it in person, but just a thought, but thank you. Excellent. So great conversation. I, I appreciate it. Milagros, go ahead. Maria Milagros. Yes, I, I took an uh, interpreter and translator uh, training before for Clover Park. And they what they do is that they take a, a, a day, a complete day, like four, five to five hour or something like that. And the morning part is like you are doing right now, uh, foundation and uh, theoric, the, all theoretical. And the, in the afternoon, we do role play, practice between each other. And when we finish the the all the, the training completely, then they give a certificate for the time, hours or that you uh, got in the training. Yeah, and, and, and I remember in the past, uh, my dad and I used to do it that way. We used to kind of divide it in two parts. We do theory first, uh, like all the foundation that I'm sharing with you guys today. And I think Lucrecia has been in one of those ones. I, I forgot who else have been on those trainings, but we used to do it like that. We used to practice, we used to bring a teacher and we used to do the practice one in one and, and do all that, so. No, but excellent questions, great suggestions. I'm, I'm actually taking notes so that in the future we can go ahead and, and do that, okay? So, perfect. Thank you. 
Okay, so I have a little bit of a, of a um, not a quiz, but an exercise. So based on the knowledge that I share with you about the five ethics and the standards of practice, I want you guys to decide whether we should do the following things always, sometimes, or never. And I'm going to read a statement, and I want somebody to yell out, always, sometimes, or with caution, or never. OK? So you guys ready? So interpret everything exactly as it said. Always. Always. Perfect. Always. Always. Yep. Excellent. Always. Inter interpret things that are not polite or that may seem wrong in the applicant's culture, including cuss words or rude language. Interpret things that are not polite or that may seem wrong to the, to the teacher, including cuss words or rude language. Sometimes I go ahead. Anybody? <laughs> this is, this is yes. a, sometimes with caution. Because yeah, it's exactly how it's said. Yes. Okay. So that's okay, an excellent always. point. I want to say excellent... always, but I probably wouldn't do it. <laughs> that, always. Yes. The answer is always. always. And yeah. again, I I mentioned before that sometimes you have to interpret the tone, even the tone, the angst, the now you always have to remain respectful. So that's why you need to always begin the interpreting session by saying to the teacher and the mom or the or the or the dad, I'm going to interpret everything as you say it. Mm -hmm. Everything. So that, that way, sometimes if they say something inappropriate, you have to interpret. And I've been sometimes in situations where the parent or the mom is saying things that sometimes don't make sense and they keep repeating themselves over and over and over. And the teacher is looking at me and saying, what are you doing? I said, I'm not doing anything. The mom is repeating herself over and over and over. So sometimes it's, it's difficult, but sometimes you have to do it. Okay, here's the next one. Summarize a message from one or more speakers. Summarize a message from one or more speakers. Never. Never, exactly. Never. You never summarize. You always, always interpret everything. Of says. Okay, so here's here's yeah. a question then, given that information. So there is a literal equivalent and there's a dynamic equivalent. And literal equivalents do not necessarily translate, whereas Excellent dynamic point. equivalents do. Um, I don't know. I don't, how does one make the decision? That's an excellent point. There's no way English and Spanish is never going to be uh, the same, especially in length or especially in certain words because you don't have that word in Spanish or you don't have that word in English, right? What he's trying to say here is to render the message exactly as, as, as is being conveyed by one of the parties, right? So for example, that you remove certain items from the message, right? But as you pointed out, you can't have a literal translation of everything because the words are not literally translated from a language to the other. But the, re the, the rendering or the rendering of the message should remain always the same. Okay, here's another one. Uh, tell the participants that you will interpret everything they say. Can you repeat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell the participants that you will interpret interpret everything that they say. Always. 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 Excellent. Okay, here's a, here is a very interesting one. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe that one is okay. Tell the worker, or question me, tell, tell the mom or the teacher that her questions are not relevant to the discussion. Never. 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 never, never. You, don't, you, don't, you don't intervene in any way that way. Okay. Okay. In, in a school setting, 
interpret for family members and friends if no interpreter is available. And I think we talk a little bit about this. Interpret for family and friends. Yeah, interpret for family members or friends if no other interpreter is available. If no other interpreter is available? Uh -huh. I will say yes. I will say yes. Yes, exactly. I mean, but again, being, we took a little but bit But being of, uh, uh, impartial? <laughs> being impartial, that's the key, impartiality. And sometimes uh, if the teacher sees that you're very, I don't know, friendly with the, with the mom or the teacher or the, or, the, or the student, maybe try to disclose the relationship, right? So that the teacher is aware, right? And has no questions about, is he gonna be partial? Especially if it's a diff maybe this may not be the case in a very casual interpretation, but if it's something that is very critical, I don't know, maybe a suspension, maybe something that is going to affect the outcome of the student, or uh, I don't know, like being ex expelled from school. Those are the situations that you need to really disclose the situation so that you don't have any conflict of interest, right? So hey, you guys, I have, I have come to, uh, I've come to find that the best way for me to do this is a specific, a specifically if it's an emergency expulsion or if a, a kid has been caught in some sort of a, uh, some sort of a situation for which they're being disciplined, is I ask the the uh, vice principal or whomever it is that wants me to call the parent, I say I ask them to write out their statement, write your statement, and then I call and I say you read me your statement and I will translate it, so that the that that it's not just hey call mom and tell her this and this and her kid did that and uh, she needs to come pick him up he's going to be expelled for a week. I, I tell them, ask them to write their statement, read it. We're on speakerphone. And uh, that way there's no question about whose words were whose. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say it better. Thank you for saying that, Bill, because that's, that's the, actually the way that it needs to be done. Because sometimes, I'll, I'll give you guys an experience. I was interpreting for the hospital one time and this nurse was very busy. And then she wanted me to give the discharge instruction to, to a mom who just delivered a baby. And then, I mean, I could, I could do it because she has a script, but I said, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable doing this. I mean, well, <laughs> number one, I mean, it's, that's not my job as an interpreter. You're the nurse. I should, you should just be there and I'll interpret for you everything you say, right? But I shouldn't be put in a position where I have to be acting outside my role. And, and, and in your example is perfectly. I mean, you're not the principal, you're not the vice principal, you're just acting as a, as a communicator of the message. And so, so yeah, thank you. Any other, any other questions, comments? Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, so I, I wanna make, I wanna make a comment about uh, okay. what we're talking about. So what I usually do if I'm being put in a spot um, sometimes for interpreting for a friend and um, before we pursue interpreting I always say this is my friend and she wants to talk to you about this and first ask her if she's okay me interpreting or translating for her and so then they ask and I just like um interpret between them and I think that's kind of like taking off your hat friend and putting it in the side and having that professional on you at that moment. Absolutely you just said exactly what I was saying earlier I mean you just have to um, you just have to uh, just disclose your relationship as I mentioned before. Okay so I have a few other things that I'm, I'm going to skip here, but you're welcome. I'm going to send you guys this, this, this slide later. Um, but we had great conversations and thank you everybody for your uh, interesting comments and, and, and topics. This, is, this is, has been a fantastic conversation. So right now we're going to move a little bit about interpreter skills and protocols. This is a very interesting one. 
But before I do that, uh, uh, I'm gonna share this one and then I'm gonna do a, a temperature check to make sure everybody is still with me. And I might give a little bit of a break, but uh, so let me, let me check on how, how, how far we go. And, and, and I'll ask you guys uh, a few things, okay? So, so the, the, the purpose of this, uh, the objective of this unit is we're going to discuss the steps that need to be taken in order to successfully interpret a session, right? We're going to discuss appropriate positioning and strategies so that we can allow the applicants and, and, and teachers to engage with each other rather than to the interpreter. We're also going to discuss the importance of using the first person and also recognize limits of how much in, an interpreter can actually remember before they say, hey, I need some, I, you need to stop. And we're also going to discuss a little bit about memory strategies too and memory exercises as well. So I'm going to share some a video with you. Okay, so I want you guys to pay attention to the video. And uh, I'm going to skip this because you guys already know a lot about this. I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to this later, but I want to show you the video first. I want to show you this video. And let me see, let me know if you have any questions. So let me just share audio to hold on let me stop sharing first will show you how to work with an interpreter. Can you guys hear anything or not? If you need help speaking with another person yes. in a different language, yes, what I is an interpreter? Green. An interpreter makes it possible for two people who Those do not green. speak the same language to understand one another. Sound. The interpreter does this by listening to the words you say and orally translating them exactly into words in another language. Now we will no show video. you some examples of how to and how not to work with an interpreter. No can, video. It's just listening. We can hear it, but we can't see it. See the video. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay. The joys of technology sometimes. Hold on. Oh, sorry, sorry, my bad. I'll get back. Can you guys hear it? No. So before you share your screen, can you click on um, share uh, computer audio?
Ricardo, I um, I found the same video. Do you mind if I share my screen? Language. What is an interpreter? An interpreter makes it possible for two people who do not speak the same language to understand one another. The interpreter does this by listening to the words you say and orally translating them exactly into words in another language. Now we will show you some examples of how to and how not to work with an interpreter. Okay, you guys hear this one, right? I don't know why it's yeah. giving me problems yeah. today, but... Yeah. You guys send me a chat <laughs> if you guys can hear because I can't see the chat for some reason. Let's see the chat. Okay, perfect. thank you. My, my apologies, sorry. <laughs> Tell her I need to ask her some questions so I can understand her situation better. Stop. This is all wrong. To avoid... Hold on, let me low up the volume a little bit. Sorry about these technical issues that I'm having. confusion, speak directly to the other person as if he or she could understand you. Do not use phrases like, he said, she said, tell him, tell her. This is how the conversation should go. I need to ask you a few questions so I can understand your situation better. Quisiera hacerle unas preguntas para ver si puedo entender la situación mejor. Sí, gracias. Yes, thank you. Much better. Remember to always speak directly to the other person. Now, let's look at another example of how to work with an interpreter. When did you initially move into the apartment? ¿Cuándo comenzó a vivir en el apartamento? Pues en el 2006. No recuerdo exactamente. Creo que era en el invierno. Estaba nevando. Creo que el 3 de enero. No, el 5 de enero. It was in 2006, January 5th. Freeze. First of all, the interpreter should repeat the words you say exactly as you say them. The interpreter should not add, leave out, summarize, or change anything to what you say. Let's try that again. When did you initially move into the apartment? ¿Cuándo comenzó a vivir en el apartamento? Pues en el 2006, no recuerdo exactamente. Tuvo que haber sido en el invierno. Estaba nevando. Quizás el 3 de enero. No, el 5 de enero. Well, it was 2006. I don't remember exactly, but it was winter because uh, it was snowing. I don't remember exactly. Maybe it was January 3rd. No, it was January 5th. Much better. On to the next example of how to work with an interpreter. Did you give a security deposit? Di un depósito de garantía. ¿Qué es eso? Ella se refiere al dinero que está reclamando, lo que le pagó al dueño al principio, por si acaso se dañaba algo en el apartamento. Hold it. If you don't understand the question, it is the job of the person asking the question to explain the question to you. It is not the job of the interpreter to explain the question to you. Let's see what should have happened. Did you give a security deposit? Usted pagó un depósito de garantía. ¿Qué es eso? What is that? Besides the rent, did you give the landlord any money before you moved in? Además del pago del alquiler mensual, ¿le dio al propietario algún dinero antes de comenzar a vivir en el apartamento? Now we're getting it. Let's look at one more example of how to work with an interpreter. Did 
you take pictures before you moved out? Tomó fotos antes de mudarse. No, en realidad no se me ocurrió. No pensé que tendría ningún problema. Qué pena. Sin fotos no tiene caso. Stop, stop, stop. The interpreter should never give his or her opinion on what is being said, nor offer you advice about it. Let's try that again. Did you take any pictures before you moved out? Tomó fotos antes de mudarse? No, en realidad no se me ocurrió. No, I didn't really think about it. Now that you've learned the right and wrong way to use an interpreter, here are a few rules to remember. Speak loudly and clearly enough so that the interpreter can hear you well. Speak at a normal pace or a little slower if you are usually a fast speaker. You may stop from time to time if you feel the interpreter needs to catch up with you. Wait for the interpreter to finish talking before speaking. Always remember, everything you say will be interpreted. If there is something you do not want the other person to know, do not say it to the interpreter. Do not expect the interpreter to soften your words or the other person's. The interpreter must keep everything you say confidential. This means that he or she may not share anything that you say with anyone else. For information, contact. Thanks for watching. Okay, so I have some questions for you. Uh, first of all, I apologize. I don't think the audio was the best. I, I was testing it a couple of days ago, and I don't know what happened. So uh, I apologize for that. I'm going to send you all this information, and and you guys can feel feel free to review this video again if the audio was having trouble. So. I don't know what happened. So I want to ask you about the two scenarios. We have a scenario with a, with a, with a gentleman who was interpreter, and we have a scenario with a, uh, with a lady. So let's talk about the gentleman first. What do you think, what happened on that, on that session? Can anybody tell me? He eliminated part of the message and cut right to the exact date. So he didn't talk about that it was snowing, that you remembered because it was snowing, that it was either in December or January, that, that it was in the winter. He just, when she said the date, he went to the date. Yeah. Do you feel that the interpreter omitted items on the text, on the, on the interpretation? Yeah. Yeah, certainly did, yeah. So how many times do you think the interpreter added something uh, that wasn't there? Uh, did you see, did you notice that? Anybody? Beatriz, did you see, did you notice anything that the interpreter added? Just the comments, uh, the comments, the guy was adding like comments of what he thinks about the issue, like giving his personal opinion that he should have. Yeah, exactly. He said something like, yeah, if you don't take pictures, you have no case. I was like, wow. <laughs> Uh, I see. Did you notice any other errors? Any anything, anything that you think he 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 didn't do good, or anything that he could have done better? Well, I think that it seems like uh, it could happen um, between a relative. If you're interpreting sometimes with a relative or a friend, that could happen between you and your friend because you have that relationship with that person and you know and you can you, you think that you can tell them that they're they should have done that like the way the guy said to her no i understand and, and i think you touched something very interesting and i like to address what you just said sometimes when we are interpreting and maybe even not when we are interpreting maybe when we are in a professional setting and let's say we are in a meeting with our colleague and that colleague is a very close friend of ours. Sometimes we tend to relax a little bit, right? And that happens, that could also happen during the interpretation session. If we, if we are, if the client or the mom or the dad is our friend, then we may relax our standards a little bit and we may don't pay attention to certain things that we would normally pay attention to, right? So 
any other comments or suggestions that you think the interpreter did or comments, something that he could have done better? Just confusing his roles, played a little bit of the advocate instead of uh, remembering that his role right then was the interpreter. I see. One thing that I noticed is that there were a lot of dates. I don't know if you noticed, there were dates, there were numbers. Uh, he didn't, I mean, he may have a great memory, but I didn't, I didn't see him taking any notes or anything like that. I particularly like to, when I'm interpreting, particularly for uh, something that has dates and notes and uh, times of the year or something like that, especially in conference interpreting, when I'm interpreting for a conference, I like to take notes of that. That way I can uh, uh, remember the dates specifically and the times, right? So that's, that, that is a suggestion that, that I would have made to the gentleman because he wasn't, he wasn't taking any notes. Um, now let's talk about the, the other lady, uh, the lady who I think did a good job. What, what do you guys think of, the, of, of how she interpreted? She was interpreting what he was saying, and she was taking notes. That was the difference. She was taking she notes. I, li they, mm -hmm. I, like, I like that she was taking notes. Do you notice she did something pretty interesting that I want to put in contrast to the other guy? Do you guys remember about the, the, the deposit, the rent deposit? So the, the, the client, the mom or whoever it was, the client had a question about what was a, a rent deposit. And the interpreter answer, uh, what was a, a rent deposit? As opposed to the other interpreter who said, uh, could you explain what is a direct deposit the, to, the, to, the, to the interviewer, right? Uh, so instead of the interpreting asking or responding to the question of, from, the, from the client, she let the interviewer respond that question. And that's the way it should be. Even though we may know the answer, even though we may know the exact date or the answer or the time, we shouldn't, we shouldn't respond in behalf of the teacher. Right? Um, any other suggestions, anything that you think she could have done better or anything that she, you noticed she didn't do good? One thing that I really like, and I don't know if you noticed that, I like the sitting arrangements. Uh, it, even both have, they had an excellent, uh, excellent uh, sitting arrangement. I mean, the interpreter was to almost a little bit to the left. The interviewer was asking directly to the, to the client. And that way the conversation could flow between interviewer and, and, and client and not to the interpreter himself or herself, right? So that is something we're gonna talk a little bit about in a moment. So um, uh, it's very important that we remember the, the, the blessing of the interpreter. Right? Okay, so we have, let's see, let me check my time here. I'm going to skip a few slides here. Okay. One thing that is very useful is that before we meet with the interpreter, we need to have a little bit of time to connect with them, with the teacher, if all possible, connect to the teacher and the mom and explain our role as an interpreter. Okay. We're going to, and let me share with you a script. Okay. And this is what I was going to say. A successful encounter begins with a brief introduction, no more than 30 seconds, in which the parent or teacher is informed of the role of the interpreter and its limitations, along with assurances that everything will be confidential. The interpreter explains how or she works in short sentences, speaking first person, and all of that, right? So it's very crucial that we do this prior to any session that we do. I'll tell you why. That way, you already set up the rules of engagement and you don't have any surprises at the middle of the session, right? So I prepare for you 
a script. And here's a script. You can do something like, hello, my name is uh, Beatriz, and I'll interpret in, in Spanish, in the Spanish language today. Everything that I said will be interpreted and remain confidential. Speak, speak directly to each other in the first person. This is in four sentence, in short sentences and pause, so I will, so I can interpret everything. If I need to stop, I will raise my hand. Right. So it's crucial that we do this before every session. That way, everybody knows what to do. Now, if you have interpreted for this teacher before. If you have interpreted for the for the mom before many, many times and it's a recurrent meeting, you may be able to sp skip this. But if but I would encourage everybody to at least do this, and it should just take 30 seconds. Honestly, it will save your life if you do this. It will help uh, direct the conversation in a very, very easy way. Go ahead, Beatrice. Um, I was going to mention, I think this will be really important to say in you know, all of our meetings, not only for parents, but for the staff that you're going to be uh, providing interpret interpretation for, because some of them, you know, forget that there is that interpretation uh, between, you know, and they speak like, they like, they do like five sentences that they expect you to remember. So it is. Uh, I think this will help also guide the the people that you are making that translation for. It can be a teacher, principal, or whoever you're you know translating for. It will you know help them remind. It will help them remind them that um, that they need to slow down and um, maybe do it by sentences so we can do a better interpretation. Absolutely, thank you. And I want to share with you. Um, uh, I think I send you to the email. I prepare um, a script that you can you can actually print, and you can have it in your office or whatever. Here's the script. Uh, can you see it? Yes. You can use. Hello, my name is, and I'm your interpreter, your Spanish interpreter, your Kankobal interpreter. Please know that everything that happens during the session will remain confidential. I will interpret in the first person and I will say everything exactly as you said. I must interpret everything that you said. Please speak directly to the parent teacher. I would ask you to pause frequently to allow the interpreter to interpret accurately and completely. In addition, I may need to ask for clarification. I want to also uh, talk a little bit about something that I wrote here. Do you notice that I said here, I would, I would ask you to pause frequently to allow the interpreter to interpret. Whenever you're talking in a session, whenever you are saying, uh, whenever you want to intervene in a, in a conversation between the teacher and the student or the teacher and the mom or the dad, you always have to address yourself as the interpreter. So you will say something like this. Uh, excuse me, the interpreter has a question, right? That's how you will stop the conversation, right? Excuse me, the interpreter would like you to pause a little bit. It's always important to address yourself as the interpreter so that the teacher is not thinking that you are saying, I would like to pause for a little bit. No, that way the, that, because otherwise the teacher may think that is the parent saying, I would like to pause for a little bit, no. When you, are, when you need to pause for a moment, the session, you need to address yourself as the interpreter. The interpreter would like you to pause for a little bit. The interpreter would like you to clarify that term. The interpreter would like you to pause for a moment, right? So please remember to, to do that that way so that you can actually um, have that clarification and there's no confusion. Do you follow me on that? So you can print this if you want to. Okay. So, so let's talk a little bit about another thing here. Excuse me. What was that? So another thing that some other things that you can do to prepare for a, for an assignment is uh, 
remember the cultural considerations. I mean, if you're going to interpret for uh, a, a person who has very limited English uh, or Spanish proficiency, maybe you need to remember to, to speak slower, right? Uh, if you're going to interpret for an IEP, maybe take some water. Uh, any equipment. I mean, if you're going to interpret at the high school and you need the equipment, make sure you make the necessary phone calls to have the equipment ready. Maybe somebody to pass out the headphones. Uh, maybe have the expectations well defined. I don't know. And this is interesting because sometimes maybe the mom comes to the meeting thinking, something is going to happen and the teacher thinks something is going to happen right so it's always well to at least have the expectations well defined for everybody right what is the what is the mom coming to the appointment right and if she seems confused ask the teacher to please clarify that question right the expectations uh, dress appropriately too as well the degree of complexity. Sometimes if you need to interpret for an IEP, maybe you need to uh, brush up on the terminology of the IEP. And we know the IEPs could be very confusing. So um, please be sure to review the terminology a little bit before. Um, any health and safety consideration, especially in times of COVID, be sure to have your mask ready, uh, wear hand sanitizer in case you shake hands, uh, things like that, okay? so. Be mindful of those preparations prior to the prior to the to the session. Okay, so here comes the exercise part. Go ahead. I just have a question. Like when you said we we can ask for clarification, or we need to more be more knowledge about ter terminology, mm -hmm. because sometimes um, in a busy day they, they just call you and be like, okay, could you please uh, help us with this. And they don't give you time to be prepared, and sometimes a, it, mm -hmm. they use um term like they don't tell us if they are gonna be talking about medical issues or things that we we don't really we are not familiar with those terms. Yeah, and you know, think about this. And you you said something pretty interesting. Is your role as the interpreter to read the room a little bit? If you see that the that the if you see, this is actually a call and it, and it will comes from experience. If you see that the mom is having questions, uh, if you sense that the, that, the, that the client, or in this case, the mom or the dad is not understanding the terminology, if you don't understand it, most likely the, the, the dad or the mom doesn't understand it, right? So, there's a good possibility, or they may do, I don't know, but there's a good possibility that they may not have, may, they may not understand it too. So what I would do is, is read the room. And if you notice that she's not understanding, I would ask, and this is how I would address it. You would say, hey, the interpreter would like, uh, would like to see if you can clarify those term, that term that you, that you share, or the interpreter would like you to see if you could use uh, uh, a language that is more less technical, right? Or could you clarify that term? For example, could you clarify the term IEP? Could you clarify the term uh, as scholastic? Or could you clarify the, the term uh, whatever, right? So is your, is your role to interrupt the session at any given time by raising your hand and, uh, and say, the interpreter would like you to clarify this term? And that's how you intervene, right? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's a great question. Thank you. So let me ask a few questions to the group here. How would you prepare for uh, an interpret in in interpreting session? What are some of the things that I mentioned that you could use that could help you prepare for an interpreting session? We talk a little bit about the dressing. We talk a little bit about water in case it's a long session. What are some other things that you could do for yourself? Your mask and uh, hand sanitizer. Your mask, hand sanitizer. I'm going to give you a tip that I do before uh, um, interpreting something that is very complex. And to be honest with you, I should have done this before the session. 
singers, sometimes they try to vocalize before. They try to open their mouth. They try to do la, 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 or something like that, right? It would be wise if you try to vocalize a few sentences so that you don't get into the session and start speaking right away really fast, right? So try to read out loud a sentence in, in English and a sentence in Spanish and try to enunciate so that you don't so that you don't get caught on guard saying a bunch of gibberish because you can't pronounce certain words, right? And I, I encourage you guys to do that because I do that before. And the times where I don't do that, I struggle interpreting. And to be honest, I didn't do that today here. And I caught and I caught myself sometimes not able to speak very well or not enunciating very well. So it's important that you try to enunciate a little bit before the session so that you can be ready, just like singers do and, and things like that, right? So what are some of the things you want to share with a patient, excuse me, with a teacher or a parent prior to the session? What are some of the things that I said that would be good to share before the session? And I think I shared that, and I think you see them on your screen, right? So I think in my case, if I were to come to a teacher, I would say that um, my name and the college where I come from, and I will be the interpreter for um, Cajambal and English. But, and then I think that uh, Cajambal is not like a written language and we mix it between um, Spanish and Cajambal so that the teacher are aware of what is going on so that she, will, she won't be surprised hearing a word in Spanish and going back and forth, doing the code switching between uh, three languages. Fantastic, you, you said something pretty, pretty interesting, exactly. The key here is to set the expectations, right? And set the ground rules of everything, right? So fantastic, you guys are doing so good. So I'm going to, let me, let me see my time here. I believe Maria Elena White has a question. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. So I have a question just regarding what uh, what is going to be the time, the scheduled time for conference? Because like, for example, I heard that it's going to be like phone, by phone with Zoom meeting. Do, can you hear me well? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Beatriz, could you share with that? And I actually, you said something pretty cool that I'm going to share with you guys. Since you say Zoom, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something with you, an exercise with you guys. So go ahead, Beatrice. Do you know that information on top of your head? Yeah. So um, so ideally we want to be able to hold the meetings uh, via Zoom with all parents. I feel like it's for for parents, but I know uh, since um, we don't longer the students don't longer have a Chromebook, so parents used to have uh, be able to use the Chromebooks that the kids had at home, now they don't have it. Um, so for parents who are not able to access Zoom, we're gonna be using, we're gonna be doing the conference via phone. So for example, uh, the thing is after school, I can do that at home because I live in Olympia, Southeast Olympia. So that's why, so it's not, it's, it's, it won't be like person, the, the parents come to the school. No, we are, uh, because we're still following uh, COVID guidelines, we're not letting any parents come into the building. So we'll have, oh. yeah, but you will have, you will do Zoom with the teacher, but then the call will have to be, you know, if parents are not able to access Zoom, then, uh, we'll have to do that call to the parents. Yes, so, I, I, so that means I can be at home after, so like for example, work in the morning here and then uh, follow the schedule, conference schedule at home with my phone, home phone. I is think that, right? that every building is doing it different, different, so I will check with Bill. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm back, sorry. I just had a, to interpret for an emergency expulsion. Um, anyway, 
So Maria, the deal is if you can call from home yes. without violating any personal information, then yeah, you can Zoom and call at the same time. If you though must use a phone where uh, you don't want it, where the, the recipient of the call could see the number and you don't want that to be your number, then you'll have to stay at school and work from the office. No, so for me, I never, I don't want to let, give my phone number. Okay. So I, I will use the, the star 67. However you can do it, yeah. If you can do that from home, that's fine. If you can't do it from home, then you'll have to work from the office. So what other buildings are also doing is because the teachers are doing conference from school, um, what uh, other buildings are doing is that they're letting the teacher make the call um, and then you'll be just through Zoom with them. Um, that's what is happening in other buildings. So the teacher makes the call from the school and you're available to just do the translation. So okay. what, what I have arranged is that if a, if a parent does not have a Zoom option, then the interpreter will make the call to the parent, will Zoom with the teacher, and it will be an open phone line, so a conference call uh, with a speaker phone. The parent will hear the, hear the teacher, hear the interpreter. The teacher will hear, hear the parent, hear the interpreter. And uh, that's the only way we can do it, because there are a lot of parents who do not since we've re we've collected the Chromebooks and they have dropped uh, brought back the the hotspots, half at least or maybe more people don't have Zoom options, so it will be have to be by a, a conference call of sorts. Okay, yes, it sounds like it was like it's gonna be like last year, the school year, right? It was sort like of. that. Uh huh. Yes. Sort of. Thank you so much. It looks like Beat Be Be Beatriz and Maria have another question. They have a question, Beatriz and Maria. Go ahead. Yes, um, my question in the case that the parents didn't accept block calls, how uh, the interpreter, in my case, I don't have problem because I have a work phone, but for the interpreter that don't have a word phone, what are they going to do if they, they mark asterisk or star 67 and the call never enter because the uh, phone number or the cell phone that they have the parent didn't accept block calls? Well, that's what we're saying that um, you can try that, but if that doesn't work, then the teacher will have to make the call from the school. And I think we did that with uh, one interpretation down at Evergreen with Lucrecia. And even by the by doing that, by the, the teacher did the call from the school and the interpreter was able to listen very well and do the interpretation. So if it's, that's not a choice, then the, the, parent, the teacher will have to make the call from the school. So I can tell them, uh, my, my teachers that have to make calls that, uh, in my case, no, but in other cases, if I, I know about others, that they have to make the call from the school then. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I, think, I think it's a, a good idea because um, the interpreter is just there to interpret. So like Ricky say, a teacher has the responsibility to make that call for the interpreter and the parent. Is that what we're doing it because the interpreter don't have access to a skyward uh, to get those four numbers for mom or dad. So if they only were given one number for, let's say mom, and they don't answer and that's it. But the teacher have access to a skyward that I can try many other numbers. So I think it should be the teacher's responsibility that it's setting up the conference because we are just there as an interpreter. Okay, I, so that means that uh, the teacher made a call, but I, 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 the interpreter will be all time uh, in contact with the teacher through Zoom. Okay, thank you. I always, I have, I have the saying. Beatriz knows about my saying is that you don't see Beyonce setting up the the the, the chairs at the concert. <laughs> so you guys are the interpreter. 
uh, you guys are there to interpret, so I wouldn't worry about those details, right? So I can always say to my dad, I used to tell my dad, I said, Beyonce is not here to set up the chairs for the concert, I'm here to interpret. So, <laughs> so anyway, so, okay, great conversation. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the position. What is the best way to sit in a, in a session? So um, this video doesn't have any sound, uh, it's just the, um, the positioning, right? So here, these are some tips that you can use when you are sitting in a, in a, in a conference, okay? When a language barrier exists, the presence of you will see. Thank you for being here today. I really appreciate you coming out. Um, I just want to start by asking you just some basic questions. Um, who all lives at your house? Vivo yo. Okay. Can you guys hear me? So this, this video shows a little bit about the positioning of the interpreter. You saw two videos, uh, well, two, two scenarios, right? You see the first one, they're, si they're sitting in a circle. The best way to sit in a session is this way, always. You have the parent, Right here, you have the, the teacher here. And if all possible, it's always good that you stay a little bit behind the, the parent. That way, the two, the two speakers can connect rather than you creating a barrier here in, in the middle, right? So it's always, this is the best way to do it. So, so I recommend you guys doing it this way, okay? Any questions about this? So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna skip a few here. Oh, Ricky, I think Griselda had a question. Do you still have oh, a question, ahead. Griselda? No, not at the moment. It's it's not important right now. Well, feel free to ask at any time and, and, and please, uh, and about it if you have any questions. Thank oh, you. okay. Thank you. Uh, it's always important to always speak also in, in, in the first person instead of, instead of saying she said, he said, she said, and, and, and all of that, right? Always speak in the first person because it's easier to follow. Okay. And uh, I can talk a little bit about that. Okay. Let me skip this one and I'll, and I'll just talk about something here. One second. Okay? okay, and this is what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Always ensure that after you, the interpretation encounter is always best, is always best in a session to always try to remain neutral after the, especially for sensitive and difficult interpretations, right? Uh, it's always best if you step out of the room a little bit or stay away from it, right? So that you don't have that appearance of, uh, of not being neutral in, in, after the session, right? And I know it's hard for, for the role that we do as advocates too and, and liaisons, but uh, if all possible, during the during an interpretation setting, especially difficult ones, if you can remain neutral by by no associating too much with the other party, uh, it's a good idea sometimes to to basically do a, 
I call it a debrief session, right? So if you can do a debrief with, with, with the teacher after your, your session ended, it will be good so that you can say, hey, you know, I like, I like this session. However, it would be a good idea if you could next time speak a little shorter sentences because that was really hard to follow you. I do that sometimes, to be honest, and it's hard sometimes to do it, but it's always good to do that because, I mean, it's, if, if, if you see that you were having a hard time interpreting, it's always good to have a, a debrief with the teacher after. And the last one that I want to talk to you guys a little bit about is practice self-care strategies, right? So particularly when you have to interpret for something that is really difficult, I think uh, Bill just said you just interpret for, for, a, for an expulsion of some kind. Uh, sometimes those sessions take a toll on you. So it's always good to practice self-care, right? To, to relax yourself a little bit, to, to just stay, you know, calm yourself, drink some water. Uh, if you need to talk to a therapist, of course, maintaining confidentiality, that's always a good idea. Just keep in mind of your own self, right? Especially after difficult sessions or sessions that are very long, particularly like conferences. I remember after the, the high school graduation, sometimes I have to take a moment in my car, you know, to, to relax a little bit because those things take a toll on you. So, and if we have time, I'm going to go over these videos that I, that I didn't have the chance to share. I'm running, I'm running a little bit of uh, short on time, but um, I, I can always send these, these conversations, this, this slide with you, and you, got, you can review it at your own time. But, uh, but that's a little bit about some things that I, that I do. And before I, I, I continue, let me share with you a few things here. One of the things that is very important as an interpreter is, is the skill of memory, okay? And as the next uh, topic in our, in our training, what are some of the skills that you need as an interpreter, okay? You need to concentrate on the message. You need to always make no judgments when you are, uh, when you are listening because that deviates your mind of the topic. So for example, if you are least interpreting and you try to make a judgment or make a, of think about, oh, they shouldn't have done that or they should do this, that deviates your mind from the task of interpreting, okay? One other thing that you can do when it comes to listening skills is that try to ensure that the, your surrounding area is free of distractions. So for example, if, if, there are, if there's a teacher or somebody talking very loudly next to you, maybe you could ask those, those people to please stay away a little bit while you're interpreting so that you can listen to. One of the things that I tell you that is one of the worst things that could happen during an interpretation is distractions. To me, that is something that, I, that is really, really hard for me to concentrate. So, uh, so please ensure that your environment is clear of distractions. And like I said, when you're interpreting, Try to not to make any judgment. Try not to think about the situation on itself. Just simply try to convey the message, right? Try to stay within the message, right? So I have, a, I have another skill is memory. One item that is always sometimes hard is the, is the short-term memory. So short-term memory, I'm not gonna go into the skill on developing short-term memory, I have some ideas that you guys can use, and I can share that in, in detail next time, but I want to do an exercise with you. I want you guys to either write on your computer, grab a piece of paper, uh, and I'm going to ask you to recall the list of items or the list of steps in this one minute recipe, okay? I want you guys to either memorize it, I want you guys to write it, I want you guys to just just do something, right? And I'm gonna ask a volunteer to, after the session, to, to recall the most items. And 
Uh, who could be a good one? Beatriz, could you help me with that? I want you to write down as much instructions that you can in this, in this recipe. I want you just to remember it and you can use notes, you can use anything that you think is good that could help you remember this, this recipe, okay? Are you ready, Beatriz? Is Beatriz with us or is she on mute? I'm here. They're putting me on the spot, but yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, thank you. So remember, just re, do you use your memory or use notes or use anything you want to, okay? Get ready. Can you hear it? You hear the music, right, Beatrice? Yes, I can hear. Okay, so just let's pay attention, okay? So can you tell me as many items or, or instructions that you remember from, uh, from the video? You picked the wrong person for memory. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was too quick. I was just, you know, writing down. I was first, I was trying to just stay focused on how much of the items. And then I was like, no, but then I was missing out on the items that I needed to. Huh? And then an email, an email pop out on my screen, and then I got distracted, and I stopped taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so you, no, go ahead. I got like five minutes, butter, sugar, eggs, nutmeg, I got cinnamon, I got apple cider, three cups of flour, uh, you have to let it sit for a minute, and then you have to grease the bowl, then you have to let it sit for another 45 minutes and then you have to bake it for 10 to 15 minutes on 475. That's all I got. <laughs> You're good. That was actually really good. I mean, I don't know. Can anybody, I don't know if anybody did the exercise, but I, I think she did good. I mean, from what you were able to capture, you, you did good. You did good. Now, I'm going to give you guys a tip. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and this is something that I do when it comes to interpreting an educational system. So the best way that you can interpret, and if you can get anything out of this training, it will be this. My best advice to you when it comes to memory skills is no taking. Now, when you are not taking, we don't, I'm not expecting you to, to transcribe everything that is being said. That's, that's not, because you, because you won't be able to do it. The speakers speak really loud or really soft or, or they don't, they speak really, really fast. 
So the best way to do this is create your own vocabulary, okay, in note taking. So for example, what you can do is say, uh, the student went up in, the, in their grades. You can do an arrow for up, an arrow up, or an arrow down for grades. You can do something like the student got an A uh, and he's struggling in math. So you come up with a symbol for math, right? For dates, it's interesting. For dates, you can always do numbers, right? 11 to, 11 to 21 or something like that, right? The key here is just to come up with your own vocabulary, right? Your own book, and it's custom to you. Again, it's custom to you. You don't have to do, you don't have to transcribe everything. So in the example of the recipe, what I would do is that what I would do, I would first make a column of recipe items and steps. And then I'll be writing down in a very short hand, in the first column of the, all the, all the, in a very short hand, all the items in a symbol, right? Uh, whether it's nutmeg, I put nut. I would then put a flower, I put a FL. You know what I'm saying? Things like that, that would just help you recall the item. You're not trying to read the item, but you are just trying to recall the item, right? Now, in educational settings, we have the ability to do that too. We can create our own vocabulary. For example, in education, you can use edu, or you can do things like that, right? So if you do that, you can create your own vocabulary to help you recall the items, right? So I have another exercise here. And I want you guys to help me remember this one. This one is a little easier, I think. Let me just check the time, where we are on time. Okay, we have 10 minutes. Uh, okay, you know, I'm gonna skip. I'm gonna skip the next exercise because we're actually short on time. The next exercise was the memory session of all the presidents of the United States. And this one has a song attached to it. But I'm, I'm gonna skip it for sake of time, but it's basically the same idea. Uh, uh, this is to remember names and this is to remember dates. So for example, for Thomas Jefferson, you can do TJ uh, and put the date, right? That is that way you remember a name and a date, right? So that is some skills that you can use when you are engaging on interpreting. Uh, when we're in person next time, we can go ahead and, 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 and refine these techniques. I have some techniques that I can show you when it comes to memory session. Another item that you can do to exercise your memory session muscle will be when you're watching a movie, uh, pause it once in a while and try to interpret what they just said into, uh, into your target language. So for example, if they do in English, uh, and if it's an English movie, try to interpret that into Spanish. Right. That's another skill that you can do to remember. So, Let's see. When it comes to the vocabulary, right? Uh, I'm sharing with you guys this, this afternoon a, a glossary of, of terms. Uh, I encourage you guys to please read this glossary once in a while and memorize maybe at least five words per, per day or two or three words per day on the glossary that I'm giving you. And that way you can brush up on the vocabulary. Uh, and this is a little bit of what I was saying to you guys. Uh, develop a system of shorthand symbols and abbreviation. Do not attempt to write everything that it says, but rather focus on keywords and action verbs. Use one language in not taking to avoid confusion. Practice not taking before trying to utilize, utilize it in an encounter, right? So, so that's it. This is this, the, the second unit. As I said, we have a third unit that is problem solving and techniques. 
Uh, I wasn't sure it was gonna have the chance to, to share this one with you, but I do have something I wanna share out of this, this unit. And that is the steps for, for um, intervening. So when you have to stop uh, an interpretation session, I want you guys to do five things. I want you to, so let's say the, it's an IP and, and there's some confusion when it comes to a term, right? So the steps to intervene are the following. You interpret the last thing that was said, and then you identify yourself as the interpreter to the, to the, to the person carrying on the session, whether it's the parent or, or the student or the teacher. Talk about briefly about what the problem is, whether it is a, the interpreter uh, has a question about the term that you just used, or the, the interpreter would like to say that the parent is having trouble understanding the, 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 the term you're using. Uh, and then what, and you go back to the other party and say to the other party, what you just did so that you can keep the transparency. And after that, you go back to basic interpreting again. So these are the five steps to doing a, a transparent intervention, right? That way everybody is in the same, uh, in the same, um, in the same uh, page, okay? And these are some steps that you can do. Uh, keep medi mediations brief. So this intervention has to be very brief only use to clarify meaning or to mediate cultural information. Begin with the, the interpreter would like to ask or would like to add. Remember, you have to say it, the interpreter. Always you introduce yourself as the interpreter. Make, a, make eye contact. Interpret everything that is said with no side conversations too. And do not offer advice or answer any questions either and return to basic interpreting as soon as possible. Okay, so those are some of the things that I want you guys to at least talk on this unit that I didn't have much time to share with you. But um, I, I can share with you and you guys can read it on your own. It has very good information. Also the workbook that I share with you has great, great information as well. But as a summary, I would like to share with you the glossary uh, on the on the documentation that I sent to you earlier. I sent you guys some handouts, and you should have it on your email. I send you um, a glossary with a lot of educational terms. That that is from the uh, California Department of Education. It's still applicable. is is very applicable to us. I've, I I rely on that glossary a lot. Uh, so if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to use it. I also included other uh, links and information about, um, about information that I have encountered throughout my career about resources for interpreters. Uh, I encourage you guys to read it and, and, uh, and visit those links. But that's pretty much what I have for you this, this evening. I just wanna do a quick review and this quick review is also in the workbook that I sent you as well. So just remember that ethics are the rules that interpreters will always have to follow. Remember the five points of ethics are accuracy, confidentiality, impartiality, role boundaries, and professionalism. You always have to interpret in first person. Interpreters always should signal to manage the piece of communication. Remember the interpreter has a question. The, you should always take notes as well to help your memory be, be recalled as well. Uh, always try to be transparent when it comes to the, to the conversation. And also use your judgment when it comes to intervening strategically to, to avoid on overstepping your boundaries as an interpreter, right? Always remember, uh, enhance your vocabulary and memory skills as well. And, uh, but that's all I have. I wanna keep some minutes so that we can uh, answer some questions. <laughs> you have three minutes, but if anybody has some comment or questions, feel free to share with me.
Ricky, can I just uh, step in real quick? This is Jean. Go ahead. I just wanted to remind everyone that we would like to pay you for these two hours. And uh, please mark that time on your time card and make sure um, after all the parent conferences are done, um, any work that you do for us and for our staff, it's the hours above and beyond your normal day. Um, we want to pay you for that time. So make sure the time cards get into Betty or myself. And Ricky, um, I, there might be some more questions, but I just wanted to just give you a big thank you. It's such good information. You're so professional. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for taking the time to share such good information. Thank you, thank you. And again, if I can be helpful in any way, Beatrice and everybody else, feel free to contact me. I'm, uh, I have a open door policy and, and I'm always here for, for you guys at any time of day. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything. Thank you. And, the time went uh, too fast. Yeah, it was a very good I, conversation. So I, I, I know, really, I, and I wish that we could have more time. And like Jean said, maybe we do a follow up before our spring conference. It's a lot of information that, I mean, a lot of helpful information that I'm sure all of us will be using, but um, I wish we had more time to go over, you know, the, the other items, but I appreciate everything and thank you very much for taking the time to do this for us. No, you're welcome. And if you want something more specifically or more catered to a skill building, we can do that too. I, I can show you a little bit of the, the tips that I use that could help in during the interpretation session. I think that could you could benefit a lot from that. Thank you. We'll, 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 we'll sure talk about it. And come up with the new new training before spring conference. I'm sure Jen and I will have, we'll be happy to have you again. Sounds good, thank you. I'd love it. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you.